across the highway of life One that leads from Calvary to eternity with Christ I'm gonna stand up for what I stand for Fight to the finish and win the war Keep on receiving from the one I believe in Welcome to another edition of Moments of Truth. Larry Hance, evangelist from Lewistown, Illinois, right here on Christ Vision Television. And we've started right off here this morning. We're having a great day. We're having fun. We're serving the Lord, and we want you to be a part of that. I'd been uh, going through some songs here and thought I had a song all picked out. And uh, we let the tape run a while, and here came another one, and it kind of struck me today. And uh, I want to sing it for you and maybe with you if you just join me in singing out there an old tune called I Wouldn't Take Nothing for My Journey Now. Gotta make it to heaven somehow. Well, I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. Gotta make it to heaven somehow. Though the devil tempts to try to turn me round. He's offered everything that's got a name, all the wealth I want, worldly fame, if I could still, I wouldn't take nothing from the journey now. Well, I started out traveling for the Lord many days ago. I've had a lot of heartache, met a lot of grief and woe. But when I would stumble, then I would humble down. There I'd say I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. Well, I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. Gonna make it to heaven somehow. Though the devil tempts and try to turn me round. He's offered everything that's got a name. All the wealth I want, worldly fame. If I could still, I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. There's nothing in this world ever takes the place of God's love. Silver and gold couldn't buy a touch from above. When the soul needs healing and I begin feeling his power, I could say thank the Lord I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. Well, I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. Gotta make it to heaven somehow. Though the devil tempts and try to turn me around. He's offered everything that's got a name, all the wealth I want. Worldly fame, if I could still, I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. If I could still, I wouldn't take nothing for my journey. Gotta make it to heaven somehow. Though the devil tempts and tries to turn me around. He's offered everything that's got a name, all the wealth I want, worldly fame. If I could still, I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. If I could still, I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. And I really wouldn't take anything for my journey now. I'm happy serving the Lord have a variety of things that I want to share with you on today's broadcast, going to do things just a little bit different than what we have in the past, just for the sake of change, and at the same time sharing with you the truth. Now, a lot of people pay no mind to sin, but I want to point out to you today that sin is like a rattlesnake, like a rattlesnake lurking under a rock. I remember the story of a father and a little boy trafficking along in a desert. The little boy had been taught to take first order command from his dad. In other words, I tell you once, and when I've told you, you respond immediately to what I have told you. The little boy was up ahead of his dad. He was hiking right along like little boys will, whether they're in a desert or on the mountaintop. And all of a sudden, the dad yelled out loud, as loud as he could, Stop, he said, and the little boy stopped dead in his tracks. And there he had his daddy point out to him the rattlesnake lurking under the rock, poised and ready to strike him as he went by. 
The little boy, pale-faced, trembling, turned to his daddy and he said, Isn't it good that you've taught me to obey upon the first command? Sin, my friend, is like a rattlesnake. Here's a story that comes from the pen of a Viola Walden. What happened to your finger? She asked the man who had lost his index finger. A snake bit me. How did a snake bite you, she pressed, her curiosity aroused. He said, the stick broke. Now keep in mind what I'm saying. What stick? What were you doing, she continued. It seems that he had caught a large rattlesnake. By the way, let me say in the outset here that sin will take you farther than you want to go, and it will keep you longer than you want to stay, and it will cost you more than what you want to stay. The only remedy for sin, my friend, is the blood of Jesus Christ. If we will repent and plead the blood of Jesus Christ, He will of a surety cleanse us of our sins, all of our unrighteousness, will cast our sins into the sea of God's forgetfulness, will forgive them as far as the east is from the west, and uh, He will no longer hold them against us. Well, this man, as I say, was uh, in the process of demonstrating a snake that he had caught. He kept this deadly monster in a cage. Thus it had never attempted to strike him. However, one day, and of all the things, I don't know how people take up with some things that they do, but he, he took the snake into the living room to tease his wife. Well, teasing wouldn't last very long if I were to have a rattlesnake in my possession caged up and take it into the living room to tease my wife. The teasing wouldn't last long, you understand. But he dumped the snake out of the bag that he had confined it in. Now, follow along closely. Listen closely. He dumped the snake onto the floor. His wife fled in terror. Well, to go back and correct what I said a moment ago, the teasing wouldn't last long. The thing wouldn't even really have gotten started because snakes and I have no compatibility whatsoever, so I wouldn't even have the snake to turn loose in the living room. But when he, when he dumped the snake out of the bag onto the floor, she fled in terror. And uh, he quickly took a stick that he had, and he placed it behind the snake's head, holding it firmly to the floor. Well, the snake writhed, and it twisted, and as it did so, the man pushed harder, you see, on the stick. But suddenly, the stick gave way with a loud crack, breaking right in the middle, as quick as lightning. The huge rattlesnake arched its back and struck. Yes, its deadly fangs filled with poison stuck into the man's extended finger. Prompt medical treatment saved the man's life, but his finger had to be amputated. Sin, my friends, sin. This is why Jesus went to the cross. Sin is like a rattlesnake. You cannot tease sin. You cannot appease sin. You cannot play around with sin. Sin is never satisfied, never satisfied until it has injected its deadly poison into your life biologically and your bodily into your body and spiritually into your soul. The best way, and please hear me today, the best way to kill paralyzing sin is the same way you should kill a rattlesnake, quickly and completely. You don't toy around with a rattlesnake. You don't toy around with sin. You repent of sin, and you get out of the sin business because sin is like a rattlesnake, and its strike is deadly. I repeat, it will take you farther than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay. It will cost you more than what you want to pay. Proverbs 23, verse 32 says, At last it, that is sin, biteth like a serpent, and stingeth like an adder. Well, I think at this point I would sing another song for you today on uh, Moments of Truth. And, uh, you know, it would encourage me a great lot if I could hear from somebody out there in the listening area 
why don't you watch for the good numbers as uh, we go off the air today and uh, give us a call, give us a, 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 a smoke signal, as one of my Indian friends calls it, on the email. Uh, look at our web page. Invite us to come and uh, minister in your church. In the meanwhile, I want to tell you, I claim the only source that is sufficient for the sin problem, and it is simply the blood of Jesus Christ. I claim the blood. I hope this is your claim today as well. Thank God. I have a source of strength when I am weak that takes me through when life is pressing me. I have a source of power from above I'm covered over by a shield of love I claim the blood Jesus shed on Calvary those precious blood we have on the uh, circuit today, but I'm sure I'm speaking to some church members out there, and uh, I want to title what I'm about to share with you this way. If every member were just like me, 
You can tell by looking that I'm uh, uh, well along in years. I'm uh, working on uh, my 10 now, the three score, and we've come to the 10 level. But uh, in these years, I've been around a lot of churches, been on the ministerial circuit for 40 years, and I have seen a lot of things. And uh, these things uh, will help you to understand sometimes what bothers us, what causes the problem, or the problems, as it were, in the respective churches. So if every member were just like me, think about this today. How many morning services would we have if everyone would stay home when I stay home? Does that make any sense to you? Ever think about that? It becomes awfully convenient sometimes to just stay home, doesn't it? Well, the Bible says in Hebrews 10, 16 through 25, that it's a sin to not assemble with those who love the Lord. Yeah, you take your Bible and, and you read it. Uh, the story is told about one woman who marched to the bedroom door and she said to uh, her husband, she said, I said, get up. He didn't move. He just laid there and kept right on sleeping. And pretty soon she went back and she said, I'm repeating to you, you get out of that bed. You've got to get up. And uh, he responded a little bit and turned over. And when he did, he said, you tell me why I should get up. And she simply said, because you are the pastor of the church. Well, a lot of people expect the pastor to always be there. The pastor expects the people to be there. Now, how would the morning services go if everyone were to stay home like perhaps you do? Secondly, how often would the evening service be canceled if no one would go except when I go? And we've got down to the baker's half dozen almost in the average church anymore on a Sunday night. And on a prayer meeting night, most churches don't know what a prayer meeting is. I'm here to tell you it's time that we wake up out here in the church world. How often would the Sunday school meet if others would attend only as I do? I know so many adults today that think they have arrived, and I've heard them say, oh, Sunday school, I don't need Sunday school, that's for the kids. Well, I'm here to tell you you're deceived. Uh, it comes down to the point now today that Bible ignorance is of a great premium. Like one man said inquisitive in a youth class, said, how many can tell me uh, about the epistles? One young man raised his hand and said, yes, sir, I can answer that. Said, everybody knows that the epistles are the wives of the apostles. God help us today. Now, if every member were like me, how much Christian instruction would the children of my community receive if other parents would pay only as much attention as I do to the truth? You think on that just a little, just a little bit. Now, I'll tell you, truth is to be bought and not sold. And uh, we'll know the truth, Jesus said, and the truth will set us free. Then, if ever a member were just like me, how many neighbors, and this reminds me, two young men, we're walking along uh, a church sidewalk, and here was the church marquee, and, and it said on the church marquee, love your neighbor as you love yourself. One young man turned to the other, and he said, love my neighbor as I love myself. He said, man, I don't even know. I don't even know my neighbor. A lot of professed Christians don't know their neighbors, and many, many times the neighbors are in need of salvation, they're in need of the Lord, they're in need of somebody to tutor them to the spiritual aspect of living. How many neighbors would be invited to church services and welcomed if others would invite and welcome people only as I do, or as many as I do if I fail to do it? How would the church fare in this? Then how many prayers would be offered for my pastor, for my neighbors, and uh, for my church if others would pray only as much as I do. You know, the Bible says, Paul the Apostle said, we're to pray unceasingly. Jesus said, men ought always, and of course you ladies are included here, people ought to always, Christians ought to always pray. Amen? And then the last thing I would challenge you with on this particular wavelength is this. How many words of testimony 
And you know the Bible says, the psalmist said, and let the redeemed of God say so. I have seen spiritual cowards. They're afraid to open their mouth for God. They'll talk about everything under the sun, including the sun and the moon and the stars and the weather, the rain, the snow, the sleet, the hail, the hurricanes and the tornadoes and the typhoons. They'll talk about all of these things, but they don't say very much about Jesus. How many words of testimony would be given for Christ if others would speak out for Christ only as much as I do? Well, I'm gesturing to me, but I want to tell you what. I'm, I'm not a slaggart when it comes to speaking out for Jesus Christ. I, uh, I speak out for Christ at every God-given opportunity and try to not lose those opportunities. For they're like the waves. They come and they go as the tides come in and go out. And we must take advantage of the opportunities that God gives us to speak up for the Lord. Well, now, if every member were just like me, what kind of church would my church be if every member were just like me? Well, you think about that, and I'll tell you there's a tremendous challenge. Then I would add here today, and by the way, mention again to you, we'd be delighted to hear from you by phone, by email, or in the mail. It would be a thrill. Why don't you do that today? When the broadcast goes off, look at those contact numbers and get in touch. Now, what brand do you wear? In 1845, a Texas lawyer unknowingly started something that would make his name a part of the American language. A graduate of Yale University, he was a good frontier lawyer. As a member of the Texas Republic's First Congress and later of their first legislature, his name became well known. He was distinguished looking, dressed in the fashion of that day. He was sharp. He was a leader of men, but he didn't have much cow sense. That's what I said, C-O-W. He didn't have a lot of cow sense. You've heard people say, well, that, that person doesn't seem to have much sense, said they don't even use good horse sense. Well, here's a man of which it said he didn't have much cow sense. He took 400 head of cattle on a debt, left them in the care of one single cow hand, his cow hand had an easy thing going. He didn't bother to brand the calves, you see. They were allowed to wander, resulting in their being found and claimed by neighbors. A red, red hot iron searing through hair and hide marked them permanently as property of the finders. Didn't I say the lawyer didn't have much cow sense? After the Civil War, Many unbranded cattle were loose in Texas. Now, I didn't live during the Civil War. Some folk look at me and, and wonder if I didn't come out of that era of time, but uh, really I didn't. But many had come from the herd. Now listen, of the lawyer Samuel Augustus Maverick, people over the state began to refer to any unbranded beef then and you've heard it yet today, as one maverick. The term maverick means something. And I want to make a spiritual application here. The term maverick means one without a particular brand. We hear people talk today, well, what brand are you? Are you a Methodist? Are you a Nazarene? Are you a Baptist? Are you apostolic? Are you Pentecostal? Are you uh, Presbyterian? Whatever, whatever. I've said it twice. Forgive me, but uh, we, we think in terms of a brand, you know. Well, God's not going to look at our brand, the tag. It's not what over it, that's over the door that counts, but it's what's in your heart that makes the difference, you see. The brand is a spiritual application. So remember this term. Now, uh, most people have a little maverick in them in desiring independence and shunning brands. But like mavericks neglected cattle, the lawyers neglected cattle. If we don't have our true owners, and this is with a capital O, if we don't have our true owner's brand on us, somebody will burn our hides with his brand. 
And I'm here to tell you, without the brand of the righteousness of God, the devil waits in the corridors of your life to brand you with his satanicism. And uh, I'll tell you, he's out after every soul, every professed Christian, every preacher, anybody that will serve God in any way, shape, or form. The devil is after you, see? Well, you keep that in mind. Now, these things should start. This branding, as I'm trying to... Uh, stress to you today should start with uh, well repentance has to come and then uh, uh, that includes confession of sins that includes believing on the Lord Jesus Christ in his shed blood and receiving him as Savior and all but the externality of it goes on with the addendum of baptism we should make it apparent to the world that we belong to Jesus Christ I, uh, I remember the story being told back in the old mining days said this man got saved and he was working down in the shaft mine shafts matter of fact down deep in the earth and and uh, one of the deacons that uh, met him on the way out after the service he said I'm going to really pray for you this week he said I know it's going to be a mean week for you he said just becoming a new Christian working down in the mine with those old bad mouth men and they're going to give you the what for for having given your heart to Jesus well the week went by and uh, the man, the new Christian, came in, just supposedly a week old in the Lord, and he walked in, and here was the deacon, and he said, oh, he said, I'm so glad to see you. He said, I'm glad you got back here today. He said, I want to shake your hand and uh, congratulate you. He said, how did you fare down there in that coal mine with those men, you being a newborn Christian? Oh, he said, it wasn't too bad. He said, nobody, nobody even found out. Well, God help us, folks. We need to make, uh, make it known to the world that we belong to Jesus. If we belong to Jesus, if we do, we will show it by being active. Yes, as a Christian, as a church member, as a disciple of Jesus, we will show it by being active as a member. You remember what I just read you a few moments ago about church members? What kind of church would my church be if every church member were just like me? We need to be an active member. We need to be a committed member of the local church. We, we can also help get his brand on Mavericks, those on the outside that are waiting for somebody to come to them and share Jesus Christ with them. There's a multitude of lost people out in this world today. Some of them are your neighbors. Some of them may sit by you even in the church, yes. There may be some in the pulpits. Not every preacher, I fear, is born again, and I have run into that very thing. I had a man one time in a meeting we were in. He said, just exactly what are you guys talking about when you talk about this born-again stuff? He said, I know I'm not, and he told us what church he pastored. Well, there's going to be a sad day, and one day sooner than what a lot of people want, I can assure you. Now, let me share a couple of quick items here with you today, one of which is this having to do with the census that was taken here in the United States. Some of these things you won't hear tell of, so we want to share just a few of them with you from time to time. The census warns of a gloomy future for today's nuclear family for the first time. In the United States history, the number of households, now listen, listen, made up of a married couple along with their children fell below 25% Christian America. According to new data obtained from the year 2000 census, this is one of the facts among many that we're taught. Among those factors, were the number of both men and women who delayed getting married and having kids. The increasing number of years that couples were living together after their children left home. The escalating number of single parent homes and the increasing number of unmarried couples who were cohabiting. Well, things are not doing too well in our United States of America and there are things on the horizon right now taking place that, uh, that would make one step back in chagrin. But there's one place you can go to find the answer 
and it still works today, and it is the foot of the old rugged cross. And had it not been for Calvary, you nor I would have any chance in eternity. On a hill far away,